Hey there, everybody. My name is Chris Whitesides, and I work for California State University Northridge Associated Students Outdoor Adventure Program. I'm super excited to welcome you to our first recorded tour of Yosemite National Park. I know being a recording, it doesn't apply, imply a lot of interactivity, but we're going to try and change that uh, by directing you to our Google Earth kind of curated tour, custom tour of spots that we think are the coolest in the park itself. Um, so option one, you definitely don't have to go find this link on your own. I'll share my screen and we can just follow along that way. Or if you want to do the click in and look in, the easiest way is to probably Google CSUN Outdoor Adventures and follow links to Outdoor Online. From there, you'll find an archived video section and you can click the Yosemite hyperlink. We'll try and spam that more places on our website, um, but that's the easiest way for now. Otherwise, you can painstakingly type in the URL, which is in the chat right there, or it's honestly probably easiest, is just email us at outdooradventures at csun.edu, and I'd be happy to get you that link. Go ahead and pause me if you want to go poke around and try and find that hidden link, um, or wait. I'll be quick on the emails uh, if you do want to email us for that link as well. Um, Otherwise, feel free to open up the Yosemite National Park page, which has a lot of really good information because, disclaimer, I'm not a park ranger, I'm not a biological scientist, I'm not a geologist, um, I don't think I've ever even taken a science class in my life. I'm a glorified backpacking guide, um, I just really love the park uh, and green space in general. So please treat this quick 20 minute tour as just that. We're gonna go wander around and look at some fun places. Um, and I'll rattle off some stories about the human history of the park that I think are fun and interesting. But again, please do triple, triple check and fact check me using that nps.gov page. With that being said, if you still need to pause me to go uh, find the Google Earth and bring it up, I think that's a fun way to, to interact. Otherwise, we're going to jump straight into it as I share my screen and we can see a beautiful overhead shot of the US um, where the national park system and really protected spaces in general has been referred to as America's best idea. Uh, there's more and more research papers coming out that postulate that this was the best idea um, because it checked some psychological boxes uh, with the concept of monumentalism and that our relatively young nation did not have the cathedrals, the aqueducts, um, thousands and thousands of year old sculptures, buildings, monuments, uh, but instead we had these pristine untouched places that many other parts of the world didn't have. Um, it was relatively quick that the national parks, protected lands, wild space kind of be, became ingrained in American values. We're going to go ahead and start zooming in from that big broad overview to where the heck we're going, which is kind of central, a little bit east California into the Sierra Nevada, which you can see on this inlaid picture. The Sierra Nevada is a massive mountain range that kind of runs down the central eastern spine of the state um, and is home again to some of those most pristine wildernesses and protected areas we were just referring to. Places like Sequoia National Park. Uh, Kings Canyon National Park, Yosemite, um, and even the more developed places like Lake Tahoe. Uh, still really beautiful spots um, with incredible recreational opportunities up and down that mountain range. We're going to keep on zooming in to the central Sierra into Yosemite National Park. In that inlaid picture, you can see that Yosemite National Park is not just what we've captured with Google Earth, but is actually 750,000 acres of national park. Super massive, definitely not the biggest national park, um, but an impressive size nonetheless. Today, we're gonna spend the vast majority of our time exploring Yosemite Valley, which is just this little tiny, if you can see my cursor, it's this little tiny strip of a 7.5 mile spot um, of really the, the highlights of the park. But that's not to say that there isn't beauty throughout those 750,000 acres. So without further ado, we're gonna enter into our first uh, interactive 360 degree view as we make it all the way to tunnel view and have an incredible outlook at Yosemite National Park. It gets me every time, such a cool shot. Um, before we keep jumping around and keep talking about the park, let me do a quick little intro to using this Google Earth um, function software. What we can do first is you can click anywhere on this picture uh, and you can drag to look around. If you wanna do some people watching or if you wanna center on El Capitan, 
Um, we can go ahead and look wherever the heck you want to see some cool leggings. All right. Oh, and if you see something that you think is interesting, like Bridal Veil Falls right here, you can use this plus or minus feature to zoom in your camera. Pretty self-explanatory. By zooming in, all of a sudden we've seen Half Dome peeking out um, from the very far end of the valley. If you use that minus feature too long, or you click on this little stick figure, um, you're going to pop out of that 360 degree view. All we need to do to get back in is grab that stick figure and you can place him anywhere that is blue. A blue track is going to mean that you can walk your little stick figure back and forth um, just while you're in this view. So right now we've got a different view of the park, uh, but because we were on this track, oh, we don't have it this way. Um, sometimes you'll see white arrows that you can move yourself backwards, forwards without going into that overhead view. The last and most important piece of this function is this next slide feature, which we're going to use as we hop around the park. And without further ado, let's go ahead and ascend about 5,000 feet from tunnel view to Eagle's Peak. Eagle's Peak is going to give us a little bit different view of the park as we look from the top of those big sheer granite cliff walls. Um, at tunnel view, we were about 4,000 feet above sea level, pretty high, but right now we're sitting at about 9,000 feet, which is the kind of the peak or the pinnacle um, of that valley wall. From here, we can take a peek um, at the valley in a different perspective and also start to think about the timeline of how this was featured, how this feature was geologically created. Because even for the Sierra Nevada, this is not your typical view. This does not exist everywhere in the US, let alone in California, let alone in the Sierra Nevada. So how the heck did it come to be? Uh, a lot of times we like to think of glaciers creating this, but the story actually begins much, much, much longer, uh, much longer before glaciers even came to be in the Sierra Nevada. How this really happened was these granite rocks, these big sheer cliffs like Half Dome formed miles and miles under the earth uh, and via uplifting or tectonic plate movement, that granite rock was slowly started to move towards the surface, towards the top. As that granite rock moved more and more, the hard granite stayed while the softer uh, sediment and other parts of rock was slowly worn away via erosion. With just that granite left, we start to get those valleys forming um, and with the help of some hydrological features like Nevada Falls over there in the background. So while that uplifting is really creating that separation between the granite and the valley floor, then we finally have a period of glaciation where massive glaciers um, really were everywhere in the Sierra Nevada and filling up the parts of the valley. For whatever reason, whenever I hear glaciers, I think iceberg. I know that's not true, um, but I always need to remind myself that a glacier is just really this super massive snow and ice pack um, that's incredibly dense, does not melt in one season, but melts over hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. And as it melts, it slowly, like a bulldozer, pushes downhill to lower elevations and moves sediment, pushes sediment, rock and silt away from it carving out kind of the canyon that we know today. So that was a ridiculously fast movement through 200 million years, 200 million years plus um, of geologic activity that has given us this really cool scar, this really cool feature. Let's go ahead and jump on to the next slide as we fall back into the valley floor. And we have this incredible view of the Merced River and of Yosemite Falls, which is the largest waterfall in all of North America. I don't think contiguous U.S., uh, or excuse me, I don't think uh, North America, but definitely in the U.S. it's the highest waterfall. Um, and you can see how this pretty pristine spot would be a really cool place to call home, which brings us to human history. Um, and we have records of 8,000 years of human history, far beyond the National Park Service. The, the peoples that first inhabited the valley, or most likely first inhabited the valley, uh, were called the Miwok people, which translates uh, to just that, the people. Uh, they were tribes that ranged um, through a lot of California, especially in the kind of southern Sierra. More specifically, in the valley floor itself, was a people called the Awanichi. 
and they had a really cool, they didn't call it the Valley Yosemite, they called it Awani, which translated to gaping mouth, which we can kind of see as we rotate this around, um, how you could see those granite walls, those granite cliffs acting like a mouth as they lived on the valley floor. The Awanichi people traded uh, with surrounding tribes, whether that was bumping out to the Eastern Sierra uh, by Mono Lake or down into what now is the San Joaquin Valley. The Awanichi people are still uh, around um, and call this region home, which is really cool. Let's go ahead and move from those indigenous peoples to a location just outside the park that I think is really special and really cool of Mariposa Grove, home to the giant sequoia tree. Um, which is one of the largest um, organisms in the entire world. There's some debate whether like tree systems that share roots uh, or coral reefs are, are one singular living organism, which they are. Uh, but the sequoia is the largest organism that we, as we kind of know as an organism compared to a blue whale or something. Uh, the sequoia tree is super cool because for as big, as massive, and impressive as it is, uh, it's got super duper, it almost feels like a brittle bark that you can almost like uh, rub and it'll come off. Um, and that's bark is specially, is specially adapted to be super flame retardant. Um, for as big as the sequoias are, they create one of the smallest pine cones and the smallest seeds. The seeds are like smaller than a pinky nail. Just crazy to think about then grows into that um, but during forest fires the trees have adapted not only to be able to survive those forest fires, but know that super fertile ash and soil is coming after those fires and that really engages or makes those seeds kind of fire off and if we swing around we can see for as big as the sequoias are they have a relatively shallow root system um, but regardless of these strange or different helpful or hurtful adaptations these trees can live I believe I read the oldest tree somewhere is 3,500 years old, which is nuts. Predates the Roman Empire, a single living organism, which is just incredibly crazy to me. So while we know Mariposa Grove is, is important and special, there are only so many sequoia groves. We know the valley is beautiful and has an abundance of natural life, natural resources, has water. Uh, the valley began to fill up uh, with the kind of idea and the movement of manifest destiny, of Western expansion and of uh, pioneers, settlers, homesteaders. Um, people started flooding the valley for a variety of reasons besides that natural beauty. It seemed like a really good place to start up a lumber mill. Um, it seemed like an incredible place to start your trapping enterprise. Um, it seemed like a really good place to drop a homestead, maybe right between those cliffs, maybe on top of the waterfall up style. Uh, but regardless, the valley and the larger park started filling up as more and more settlers came to California. There was also a lot of prospecting too. I didn't mention that one. Regardless, the valley is starting to fill up, um, and at some point it requires some level of peacekeeping from the federal government. Uh, one of the first battalions that came out was the Mariposa Battalion, an even more famous battalion uh, that came and started patrolling the park as we know it and became the kind of archetype or the prototype for park rangers were Buffalo Soldiers, a regiment of all African American men um, who really became the first. Uh, federally designated protectors of the park. They were dubbed Buffalo Soldiers by the indigenous peoples that called this place home because of their hair. The thick curly hair reminded indigenous people of the hair of a buffalo. They got the name and the name stuck, but they were incredibly important in paving the way for uh, the national park system, park rangers, and resource protection at a federal level. Let's keep on jumping around as we go to slide nine, which takes us back up to the valley wall on top of Glacier Point, where we have a picture of Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir, which I'll get to. But before Teddy Roosevelt came to the park, before the park was a national park, it's filling up. We've got a couple different battalions in here protecting stuff. Um, and in 1864, it's kind of reached a boiling point where something needs to be done to ensure the protection of this space from development. 
at that point, it was President Abraham Lincoln, super long ago, um, who signed a, I don't know if it was a bill or a grant, oops, uh, but passed an act that protected or designated Yosemite, not as a national park, but as the first federally protected lands. Um, for the history buff during 1864, there's a, Lincoln had a bigger fish to fry in the form of the US Civil War. So I like to think someone kept bugging him like, hey, there's this really cool spot. We should do something about it. And he said, I'm going to protect it. We'll get to it later and we'll form this whole big, better system. That whole big, better system eventually came in the form of the national park system in which Ye Yellowstone, too many wise, Yellowstone was the first uh, formal national park in the NPS system. Thanks to folks like President Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir, champion, advocate, naturalist, poet, uh, and so many other things. Um, but thanks to advocates like these folks, Yosemite became the third protected national park. And John Muir um, is really the champion of the park. Um, his name is on every trail. He's in every visitor center um, because of what an advocate he was for protecting this space. A lot of green spaces, um, natural spaces throughout the U.S., but in particular, Yosemite. John Muir was a Scottish-born immigrant, lived in Wisconsin for a while, studied medicine, studied biology, eventually just came out to the Sierra with a knapsack, bred, would hike these trails forever and ever, um, and really fell in love with this park and dedicated his life to protecting this space. Um, one of his kind of most famous feet, he's got a whole bunch of famous feats though, um, was inviting Teddy Roosevelt out to experience this location. The Bull Moose, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's nickname, was a bit of an outdoorsman himself. So he and Mr. Muir decided to go on a backpacking trip together. This is uh, thought to be one of the only times when the sitting president of the United States um, went missing. No one knew where Teddy was, but he and John were out backpacking in Yosemite National Park. I, don't know, I really like that story, just two, two guys going out, despite being one of the most important people in the world. Um, with the formation of the National Park, there's some level of development that comes to make uh, a park feasible. The idea that visitors need to come out with some level of comfort to experience this park, to see the, to see the nature, um, to see value, um, and to continue to be advocates for the park. One of those ways came with the Awani Hotel, which is a big, beautiful, I think it's beautiful. I think it's cool because it was designed specifically to fit in with granite rock walls and really not be obtrusive, uh, but really blend in and accentuate the natural environment. Uh, the Awani Hotel was a redesigned barracks um, repurposed by the first National Park Director, Stephen Mather. Um, so it went from barracks to lodge then it went back to army control, actually Navy control, when it was turned into a military hospital uh, during World War II. This was really cool because it was part of kind of like the cutting edge treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder amongst soldiers where they'd come to convalesce, I think that's the word, uh, where they'd come to get better um, after serving in the military. Eventually the hotel was returned to just that, a hotel um, from its short brief period um, as, a, as a military hospital. So I think this is one of the cool ways that development happens um, even in a national park to share with other people. Um, I skipped a slide, but we're gonna go back to 10 out of 15 where we see what might be a uh, different take on development in national parks. Um, so right now we are looking at Oslossany Dam and the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. One of the more controversial projects in Yosemite National Park and fought uh, tooth and nail against by that John Muir that we were talking about. You can kind of see if you squint, tilt your head to the side. If there was no reservoir here, no water, this valley might look similar to that of Yosemite Valley that we've been seeing. We've got the same massive granite faces. We've got the same waterfalls streaming in. But during the time uh, that the dam project was proposed and completed, there was a massive need for hydroelectric power in the Bay Area, um, as well as drinking or usable water for agriculture um, and the growing metropolitan area of San Francisco. Regardless of your political stance, the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir was 
uh, past and completed providing hydroelectric power and drinking water uh, and allowing the Bay Area to grow into the metropolitan area that it is today. With that being said, there are some permanent impacts of dams um, and there are some uh, folks that would argue against them like John Muir. Today, there are over 70,000 dams in the US, which is an incredible number and always blows my mind. Definitely not the same size as the Hetch Hetchy project, uh, but still quite a few. So if the Awani was our version of kind of middling development um, to have people in the park and Hetch Hetchy might be on the further end of the spectrum of higher development, um, the park as we know it now is really settled into home and its protected space um, as its designed, built mission is to get visitors out to see this protected area. I like to use rock climbing as a relatively cheesy metaphor for all that development and for visitors coming out to the park because the history of rock climbing comes from folks predating John Muir, uh, blasting, carving, scraping holes and holds for feet and hands to climb all the way to the top of places like El Capitan. Right now, what is kind of the climber's mecca, the biggest of big wall granite face climbing uh, in the world probably. So if those first climbers came and they try to do first ascents by blasting, scraping, carving, changing the face of these walls, that slowly became less and less invasive, less obtrusive. Um, we went from blasting those holes to just forcing in pitons, these massive giant nails that got hammered, slammed into the rock face where we could tie ropes to and continue those ascents. Those big old pitons turned into smaller bolts or uh, eye bolts, which you could tie a rope into and still climb up. Those eye bolts eventually went away and turned into nuts or camming devices, weird little instruments that fit inside the crack of a wall um, that wouldn't come out in case you fell on your rope. But when you were done, you could remove them so it looked like no one, uh, there was no trace left as you climbed up the wall. In an even more extreme development, uh, athletes like Alex Honnold. I think they're just crazy. Uh, but athletes like Alex Honnold are really pioneering free climbing. No carved handholds, no pitons, no eye bolts, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Just you and the face of the rock. Definitely do not try this at home, but definitely watch uh, some documentaries like Free Solo and the Dawn Wall if you want to learn more about this extremely dangerous extreme sport. Um, but again, El Capitan is kind of the climber's mecca and really um, the biggest big wall. Other folks will camp out as they do it. If we're doing it the roped way, um, they'll bring uh, portal ledges or like beds, cots that you can set up and they'll actually sleep right on the granite face as they continue on their way up. Crazy, crazy sport. But most people as they're coming to the park, and by most, I mean the four to five million people that visit the park annually are not coming to free solo El Cap, but are coming to take part in some of the most popular trails like the Mist Trail right here where we're looking at Vernal Falls. Massive amount of water coming down. This picture has got to be taken in early spring, uh, late spring, early summer, when all that snow melt is just pumping this waterfall full. Um, the Mist Trail is cool because it's the start of the John Muir Trail. There's our guy's name, John Muir. The John Muir Trail is one of the most famous trails in California, but it is a massive trail that runs from Yosemite National Park, the valley floor. This is like the first three miles of it, all the way about 21 days, 221-ish miles to Mount Whitney in the Southern Sierra. Mount Whitney being the highest point, the highest elevation in the contiguous U.S. Named after John Muir, the trail takes anywhere from 14 to 21 to 30 days um, of just backpacking. You've got your tent, your sleeping bag, your stove, everything that you would need for those 20 plus days on your back. And you've got just your feet to take you to Yosemite Valley all the way to Mount Whitney. An incredible trail. Um, and really this start is super famous um, as we go through the Mist Trail and we see Vernal Falls. Let's keep on keeping on as we pop another five miles up the trail, maybe not even five miles, and we see another just absolutely gorgeous waterfall, which is Nevada Falls. And this one's huge. Yosemite is home to over 900 different species of animals um, and home to even more flora 
um, like the sequoia, the giant sequoia that lives here. Uh, the shot is really cool. I mean, with the clouds, with the tree line, with the granite wall, with the waterfall itself, um, and with the roaring Merced River, which eventually will flow down by Fresno. Um, the shot really has it all. It really leaves you with that feeling of, of why national parks were Yosemite's best, or excuse me, America's best idea. Let's go on and finish up with our final slide as we go back to one of these meadows. One more view of the valley floor with some kind of fog and cloud rolling through. Um, yeah. Again, this is just 7.5 miles that we really jumped around. There are way more parts of the park that we didn't even get to. We didn't spend a lot of time looking at uh, Yosemite Falls, upper or lower. We didn't spend a lot of time in the Tuolumne area. Um, uh, we didn't do Olmstead Point at the back of the valley, but feel free to continue using this uh, Google Earth feature by picking up your little guy, zooming out, and really seeing all the different places that you can drop your uh, drop your view and look at waterfalls. So that is the end of our friendly walk through the park. Oh yeah, this is just in just in the park. Uh, this is our end of our friendly walk through the park. Um, again, my name is Chris. I'll open up that chat again as I stop sharing. I'll put all those links back in. So again, Google out, CSUN Outdoor Adventures, follow the breadcrumb trail to Outdoor Online where you can access even more of these videos, um, as well as our Google Earth projects. If you like that little curated uh, custom project, or if you wanna make one that's better, please do, super easy to use. Um, and then email it to us at outdooradventures uh, at csun.edu. And again, double check all my facts and information by going to nps.gov to find out um, information about the park from more legitimate sources than your friendly backpacking guide. Um, with that being said, thank you again for joining. Um, if you wanna help support CSUN Outdoor Adventures as we really try to pioneer these virtual programs during these um, stressful quarantine times and break up quarantine routines with more of our videos, uh, you can find donation tabs at CSUN Outdoor Adventures as well. And we do appreciate uh, continuing, we appreciate whatever donation or support you can give. And we do 100% intend to keep all these programs free for you to use. With that being said, if there's custom programs that we can do for your classroom, for any group, for a family, we're up for it. I'm stuck at home. I'll make 101 of these different videos from national parks to, I'm working on one diving with whales. So we've got 101 different cool opportunities coming up. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our next live or heck recorded event. Have a great day.